Sounds like a Nancy Pelosi rule. No politics. The old Lord opened my lips. And in my mouth shall declare your praise. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was on the about the blessing of the new wine that uh, will be coming, which points us to Jesus' fulfillment. The gospel lesson is actually one we usually see, I mean, the epistle lesson is one we usually see um, at the time of um, Christmas when we read it as an alternate reading in which Um, <coughs> um, Jesus will come and born to redeem those who are under the law, verse 5, so that we might receive adoption of sons. And that brings us to the gospel lesson. And then they sailed to the country of the Gerasenes, which is opposite Galilee. When Jesus had stepped out on land, there met him a man from the city who had demons. For a long time, he had worn no clothes, and he had not lived 
in a house, but among the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him and said with a loud voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For many a time it had seized him. He was kept under guard and bound with chains and shackles. But he would break the bonds and be driven by the demon into the desert. Jesus then asked him, what is your name? What? What is your name? And he said, Legion. For many demons had entered him, and they begged him not to command them to depart into the abyss. Now a large herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside, and they begged him to let them enter these. So he gave them permission. And then the demons came out of the man and entered the pigs. And the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and drowned. <laughs> and when the herdsmen saw what had happened, they fled and told it in the city and in the country. Then people went out to see what had happened. And they came to Jesus and found the man from whom the demons had gone sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed in his right mind, and they were afraid. And those who had seen it told them how the demon-possessed man had been healed, that all the people of the surrounding co country of the Gerasenes asked him to depart from them, for they were seized with great fear. And so he got into the boat and returned. The man from whom the demons had gone begged that he might be with him. But Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. And he went away, proclaiming throughout the whole city how much Jesus had done for him. So, every Sunday you get three lessons. And then the, this week and the next two, we're going to look at one of the lessons, but we're also going to say, why in the world do we get these three lessons on a given Sunday? Um, what happened here? I lost the sentence. So, the prayer of the day, the colic of the day, implores the Lord to cast out all sins and evil desires from us and that we're guided toward the good things that God has prepared for us. In other words, it's not just external calamity, but also our own fallen nature and actions that can hold us back. In the appointed Old Testament reading from Isaiah 65, the Lord sums up what was lamentably often his relationship to Israel. I spread out my hands all the day to a rebellious people. And then he proceeds, proceeds to list their sins in detail, concluding with his determination, gracious determination, note well, to salvage what was left. The epistle emphasizes how God's grace in Christ now extends beyond the boundaries of Israel to embrace all who are baptized and have put on Christ. Taking together the propers for this Sunday describe how people in a fallen world are frequently enslaved by trouble, personal danger, our own sin, and the elementary principles of the world. But how liberating God can set us free from them all as he has done in the past and does again strongly when Jesus frees the demon-possessed man introduced in today's gospel. So, I hope you see the connection for those that were in early service 
and you will see the connection for those who will be in the second service. Mm -hmm. And so taking a look at a little bit about this lesson, you will notice it begins with an incident and it ends with almost an outreach motive when he tells the demon-possessed man to go back home and tell what Jesus has done. Yes? Why do the demons choose to go into a pig? Hold the question. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It comes up. It's in here. Oh. Then they sail to the country of the Gerizines, which is opposite Galilee. So after the Lord's demonstration of power over the forces of nature, instilling the storm, that's just what's before this, Jesus and his disciples sail to a spot on Galilee's southeastern shore, opposite Galilee itself. The stated destination leads us to picture an area populated by Gentiles. It's not God's people, it's enemy territory. One of whom likely is the demon-possessed man Jesus will be. <clears throat> when Jesus had stepped out on the land, there met him a man from the city who had demons. For a long time, he had worn no clothes, and he had not lived in a house, but among the tombs. Now identified as part of what is called Kersey National Park in the Golan region, this area has a good deal of volcanic rock, and thus is home to numerous tombs. A pitiful man possessed by demons made his dwelling there. He wandered about naked and restless and had been in a sad state for a long time, also posing a threat to bypassers which received a mark. This region, which half of the tribe of Dan came and possessed, is a region that was known in the time that Israel came into the land and took possession of it. To the time of Jesus, to the present time, as a place of multiple idol worship, uh, satanic rites <laughs> from biblical times right into the present. So, so when, verse 28, when Jesus saw this, he cried out, when he saw Jesus, he cried out, fell down before him, and said in a loud voice, what have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high? I beg you, do not torment me. We're getting close to Mary's question. The demon confronts Jesus with a blunt question. What to me and to you? Literally. What, have we what do we have to do with each other? Or what do you want from me? It is very noteworthy that while the religious leaders disputed Jesus' position as God's son, the demon confesses it, frankly, with a very exalted title, Son of Man Most High. As we saw in the study of Mark, the demons are the ones that confess who Jesus is. The demons, furthermore, acknowledges Jesus' power over him, imploring Jesus not to subject him to additional torment. The demon does not waste his time, either in mocking Jesus or empty threats of consequences. If Jesus does not comply with his plea to leave the demon alone, 
he knows that in the face of Christ, begging is the best that he can do. <coughs> For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. So, unclean spirit comes out of the man. Where is the unclean spirit going to go? Back to, the, back to hell, right? Or to the right, hell? back to hell. Yeah. <coughs> so. They didn't want to go there. You didn't want to go there. <laughs> they knew that was a bad deal. Right. So, it comes here that the demon's curt demand was a response to Jesus' whole frontal attack on him. Jesus was already commanding the demon to depart and set the man free. Luke goes on to illustrate the sad consequences of the man's possession by the evil spirit. The demon had made him a menace to the community, able to overcome people's futile attempts to restrain him physically. He also is pushed off into lonely, inhospitable desert regions. The man control over himself had been destroyed as well as a harmonious relationship with his loved ones and neighbors. Jesus then asked the demon, what is your name? And he said, Legion. For many demons had entered him. So, Legion mentioned in the sermon, yeah, Roman unit of 6,000 men. Yeah, quite a few. And the demon begs Jesus not to command them to depart into the abyss. In other words, we don't want to go back to hell. Yeah, abyss, hell, rule of Satan. So, above all, the demons fear being sent into the abyss, the deep place where the property belong. They hunger after the twisted goal of inhabiting another contented creature so they can continue their destructive ways. Since they may already know that they will end up tor tormented in the abyss forever, they may be looking for a temporary reprieve. A stay of execution, if you will. Now we get to Mary's question. Now a large herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside, and they begged him to let them enter these. So he gave them permission. So what's the answer to the question? They didn't want to go to hell immediately. I don't understand why Jesus didn't send them back to hell. Um, is this like a temporary reprieve and they can come back and torture other people? Barbara. God is a God of second chances. <laughs> is that what he gave these demons, a second chance by going to the pigs rather than hell? Like, you know, go near the fire, don't jump in it yet. So, <laughs> what is God's primary nature? Grace. Love. Mercy. Love. Pamela. Mercy. Mercy. Ooh. What is mercy? Not giving us what we deserve. Not giving us what we deserve. That's, that's a second chance. We can kind so of say speak. not a second chance, but that almost oversteps it. Okay. Okay. We'll just use a speaking tape. You get a speaking tape. You go to court. 
you're guilty. You know what the penalty is. So, the judge gives you the sentence. That will be $375. You can pay that and you're free. The judge also gives you the option of mercy. You can go to driving school and sit for five or six hours in a real class or do multiple <laughs> sessions online. Are you guilty? Uh -huh. Do you have to pay? Uh -huh. One is merciful and one is Torture. to pay up right now. <laughs> Jesus came to defeat Satan. Satan's eventually going to end up totally defeated. Till this, till the day that he's totally defeated, the victory on the cross means God is in control. But Satan is going to try to use this fallen world, whatever to his advantage, to try to get as many of us to give up on the faith. <clears throat> I had a word for that. It escapes me now. But I had a word for it. It comes up in the sermon. So. Okay, we'll <coughs> listen. <laughs> Pardon? We'll have to listen for it. We'll have to listen for that word. Yeah. I wonder, but, Pastor, if... if you know, part of the reason that, you know, you had a legion of demons and that people are going to see this guy in his right mind. Yeah. I mean, there is a, there is a very visual, tangible evidence of God's divine power. Right. In watching this herd of pigs, which is, you know, they're a Gentile country. The Jews don't care about pigs because they're unclean. You've got unclean spirits going into unclean animals, it's, and it shows God's power to all these people. And this is a great witness to everybody of what God has done in in cleansing this man. And now these pig, I mean, they're not going to forget this, and they don't have to worry that these demons are roaming around looking for so someone else, else to inhabit. Yeah. So, you know, it, I think rather than being merciful to the demons, it's more of a, a, I mean, Christ has the upper hand, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the pig owner well, was, has to declare bankruptcy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, pig owner the, the pig owner had to declare bankruptcy. No more bait in the ring on. Well, no more bait in the ring <laughs> I didn't even look at that part of the text <laughs> in the lesson, mainly because I ran out of time. <laughs> and I wanted to get to the end of this lesson for today, basically to keep somebody happy who's not here. Oops. <laughs> yeah, because uh, Norm Huber said, well, the pastor got, Fro is gone, and you can't continue with First John. Um, and second John, why don't you do three weeks on outreach? And I said, oh, I have a plan. No, thank you. Well, then this text gets me to outreach, outreach. and we'll get to that outreach well, at the end. All of Scripture is outreach. <laughs> I just have one question. When you said God is in control, but Satan is going to do everything to you. And then, like, I was listening, and I missed that part. Do you so, God has always been in control. When people turn from God and listen to the voice of Satan, Genesis 3 shows the, everything that went down in the fall. It broke the relationship with God. It broke the relationship between people. You get a husband and wife. And between humanity and the created world. 
and in a sense, the created world ended up in Satan's control. All the fallenness and all the garbage of this world is Satan and his minions trying to undermine the rule of God and destroy people. And so, what you have here, very much Jesus is in control. You look at the verbiage of this whole gospel lesson, and Jesus is in control. As I say in the ser sermon, you don't beg if you're in control. <laughs> and this, the, the demon, or demons, however you want to look at it, are begging. And it's astounding as it seems that Jesus lets them go into the pigs. It's an act of being merciful even to those who are on the road to the abyss, on the road to hell. And it's a short-lived road. They get a reprieve into the pigs and they get drowned in the waters of baptism. Well, pardon me, I do that in the sermon. I don't do that here. Uh, anyway, they get drowned. And once they drown, where does that evil spirit go? Goes to hell. For a believer, what do we say? When we die, our spirit departs to be with Christ. Though it's a mystery, when death occurs before Jesus reappears, the believer's spirit goes to be with Christ. The unbeliever's departs. The Bible never says clearly departs to hell. It's pretty much an assumption here that demons are saying, we don't want to go into the abyss and they're begging for a reprieve and they're going to the pigs. Then once the pigs are drowned, they go to the abyss. I'm confusing myself. Um, <laughs> can it be said that the man's soul was possessed or the man was possessed or both? <coughs> yes. That's, what does the text say? You, the man. The man. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so the evil spirits don't need a soul. That's otherwise the last they couldn't time go he had the pit. flu. The last time you had the flu, was your spirit sick or was your body sick? Oh, the body, I guess. <laughs> Although the spirit gets pretty in other words, bad feeling. <laughs> in other words, we can't do this biblical splitting up. I mean, how many times do we realize that an illness is a spiritual crisis? Right? Sometimes. Yeah, the, because it's a beautiful faith thing. is tested. Yeah. Our mental state is tested. How many times do we recognize in sickness that things like depression. Um, when a person is sick, they're sick. Body, mind, and soul. Body, mind, and spirit. They're sick. You can't, we just can't parcel these things out so neatly the way Jesus does. Do not fear those who can kill the body. Fear, fear him who kills body and soul in hell. Mm -hmm. Well, God can speak like that for us. Someone who's sick is sick. What kind of medicine helps? <coughs> Sometimes it's the MD. Sometimes it's the psychologist. And sometimes it's the pastor. Yeah. I love visiting people in Roman Catholic hospitals. I think you're the you know, I visited, I remember the last one that was so clear. 
I visited a woman who's a member of Grace Grass Valley. She'd had major surgery. I went down to Mercy and I'm going to visit her and the doctor is going for the post-surgery exam. And I'm going to yield to the doctor, right? Mm -hmm. And he says, hey, I can wait. She needs spiritual care right now more than she needs medical care. Wow. Mm -hmm. wow. Amen to okay. that, Did you faint? So I said to him, well, if I just give a small bit, can she have communion? He says, yeah, that's soul medicine. Oh, oh that's nice. You found the one doctor that was not an egomaniac. <laughs> we found a few of those. When Pastor Jordan from Redeemer Chico was at UCD, uh, Pastor Peppercorn and I went in to see him after pastor's conference. We were there. Doctor came in, and we were ready to excuse ourselves. And he said, no. He says, I'm only here trying to figure out what God done, has done to create this person. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You, when you're done, let me know. <laughs> you run into dots that way. I was a hospital chaplain for six years. We had our egomaniacs. <laughs> we also had a number that were not. Of course, since the Lutheran Church ran the hospital, um, we had a few of the docs that were also members of the congregation, which helped. Yeah. So yes. And working with hospice as and home health, Pam knows you have docs that are eco-maniacs, but you also have docs that were on your staff and very helpful to all disciplines. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you a doctor's story. When I first came to work with uh, Hospice of Rosehill, we had a doctor who was Roman Cambrai, Dr. Bowen. And he and I became very close. And we were interviewing somebody to come onto the team. And so the whole team was doing the interview. And he was before me. And pretty soon, he's asking all of my questions. And he looks at me and weeks. <laughs> so I start the best I could to ask all the doctor's questions. <laughs> and he refers to me as Dr. Meyer. I refer to him as Chaplain Bowden. And uh, one time, we had somebody who um, I went in to visit while the doctor was talking to the family, and she was in desperate need. And I came and interrupted his conversation and said, please go check on Mrs. Anderson. And he told me that was a good diagnosis, Dr. Meyer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yes, you have doctors that have egomaniacs. Excellent people. Yeah. OK, back to our text. Though it seemed likely like a step down to the demons, a herd of pigs was conveniently nearby. And if they have to leave the man whose life they had been ruining, they preferred entering the pigs to returning um, to the abyss immediately. Jesus is willing to permit this, which is one of the most mysterious features of this account. Then the demons came out of the man and entered the pigs, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and drowned. The destructive pan plans of the evil spirits are seen immediately and in a dramatic way. They scarcely complete their transfer from the man to the pigs, and the entire herd, which presumably had been eating contentedly until now, <laughs> immediately proceeds to destroy itself. Verses 34 to 37 
give eyewitness accounts from unbelievers as to what Jesus did. Only looking at their monetary loss, they asked Jesus to leave. Down to 38. The man from whom the demons had gone begged that he might be with him. But Jesus sent him away, saying, return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. See, the healed demoniac has no such fear. He knows from what a dreadful imprisonment he had been set free. And unlike his neighbors, could not be remember <coughs> Jesus' presence and words. He is ready to leave everything behind and attach himself permanently to Jesus as a follower. Though this is heartwarming evidence of the man's faith, Jesus has other plans <coughs> for him and declines to take him along. And he went away, proclaiming throughout the whole city how much Jesus had done for him. Just as the risen Lord would later choose to continue his work and influence through human witnesses. Does that ring a bell? John 20, 20. <coughs> If you forget the sins of any, they are forgiven. Right? It's kind of this commissioning of uh, all of those gathered in the upper room. Okay. He wills for the demon demoniac to be a witness to Christ in his own homeland. Jesus does not ask the demoniac to take responsibility for convincing anyone, but simply to speak of his own experience among people he knew well. Jesus makes clear that the power of God himself stood behind the liberating wonder the demoniac had revealed this day. In other words, Telling what Jesus has done equals telling what God has done. We do not read of disappointment on the man's part at not being permitted to go along with Jesus, but we're told of his faithfulness in carrying out what Christ had enjoined him to do. So, I didn't read the book. What must friends and family need to hear? It's a book by the now sainted Pastor Clement I. Price. Yeah. Clem married a woman, Jan, who had, I think, three sisters. And uh, Jan's father was dying of terminal illness. And, pardon me if I don't say pastor, Clem went down to visit him, figuring he'd be able to visit him for a short time. And knowing that he had been baptized, confirmed, Missouri said Lutheran, but had left the church years ago, uh, Pastor Boyce thought, it's about time that I go and I talk to this guy, because his death is imminent. It's my father. So he goes down, starts a conversation with the guy, and the guy is kind of, yeah, you got to say these things if you're a pastor, but basically, I have, you know, departed from the church and departed from God, and I don't care. And he says, well, what's going to happen? You're going to die pretty soon. He says, yeah, that bothers me. <laughs> well, he ends up living. And Clem says, well, goes down, makes another visit, and says, can I write you a few things that I think you might like to think about before you die? Well, his father-in-law lives another 18 months, and he writes a series of letters. The book is, What Must Friends and Family Need to Hear? And there's no way 
today or in three weeks that I could condense the whole book for you. But I'll recommend the book to you if it's still in print somewhere. I know Walt has a copy of it. Yeah. I have a copy of it. <coughs> you have a copy of it. Les has a copy of it. All of those who know Pastor Preuss end up having a copy mm -hmm. of it. But uh, in the introduction, he talked, he listed a few things. And of course, it says evangelists speak to one another often. But that word evangelist says, okay, that's what evangelists do. That doesn't mean me. Well, out of the gospel lesson, what is there? Jesus says to the person who's experienced Jesus, tell others about your experience. Anybody here had the experience with Jesus? Yes. <laughs> Boy, all your hands should go up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Even if it was an experience before you knew, you had an experience. You know, when I was baptized, my sins were forgiven. I don't know how that worked, but I know that did happen. Jesus said something. God's word says that he is here. And he speaks to us every day. Not in some mystical way, but through his word. That's the voice of God. I can hear his voice. If I don't like reading it, there are audio books. I can actually go to a church and hear the word. And I hear it. That's my experience. I make a mess of my life, and you know that. Because you're my wife, my child, my father, my aunt, uncle, my friend. You know what a mess I've made. And I know it too, and I feel so bad about it. But I go to God, and I've experienced his forgiveness, his lifting my guilt. See, so we speak to one person often. This isn't going out and speaking to crowds, but there's one person that we know well, and we answer questions. We may not have all the answers. Mary keeps posing questions here, that at times I'm thinking, how in the world are we gonna answer that one? <laughs> Fortunately, today it was in the Bible study. <laughs> you know, and I'm sitting there saying. Because I was taught by the Catholic Church that Bible is literature. I'm still learning. And the Bible is literature, but it's a literature given to us by God so that we hear his voice. Yeah, that's not the way the Catholic Church teaches it. <laughs> it comes in history. It comes in poetry. It comes in the very voice of Jesus. They're written down by eyewitnesses. You bet. There's all sorts of forms of literature here. Oh, yeah. There's even drama. And, oh, yeah, there's apocalyptic literature. It's literature, all right, but it's the voice of God. Yeah. But if the Pope says something, that's coming from God. Yes. Yeah, right. <laughs> He's as crazy as a bed bug right now. He's leading the entire church off the cliff. <laughs> into the abyss? Yes, into the abyss. Let's not have that on tape. <laughs> I'm not going there. I'll repeat it. I'm not going there. So, remember, we work better in an environment of trust. You know, we're not going to speak well with strangers. <clears throat> um, 
having coffee with Bob Schwerman the other day, and a relative of a friend of his was out here from back east somewhere visiting. And her theological and social opinions were so off the wall with this whole sexual dysphoria. She was talking about using proper pronouns when you address people and situations. And Bob's sitting there and he's saying, I just want to smack her on the side of the head and try to teach her some sense. And he says, but I don't know this woman. Mm -hmm. Just because she's a relative of a friend, someone who trusts me and whom I trust, I have no relationship with this person. I really was not in a place to say anything. Remember, we work better in an environment of trust. If you're going to talk about your experience with Jesus, look for that environment of trust. <coughs> and when you have that environment of trust, then, no matter how pleasant, always correct false doctrine. If someone who trusts you, whom you trust, whom you know well, is going off the rails, help them to find the right track. <clears throat> yeah. And risky as it may seem, learn to speak the law. That's so hard for Christians. We know right and wrong, and we're ready just to lay down what is right and tell somebody they're wrong. We have to think, how can I winsomely, how can I intriguingly speak the law without watering it down? And if anybody knows how to do it in all situations, please teach me. <laughs> I know how to do it in some situations. I've practiced and failed enough that I've learned a little bit. Barbara. You should have left that last sentence off before I made my comment. No. <laughs> uh, you said, how can we do this? Um, uh, I know that um, beginning the day with prayer or your drive or wherever you're going with prayer is a good start to witnessing to others. Lord, lead me, teach me, show me what to say and do. Um, yeah, for years, well, partially because I, I came kind of through a path off the Lutheran path, through um, kind of a reformed Pentecostal movement. I rejected memorized prayers for a long time, and then I discovered great comfort in Luther's morning and evening prayer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you that you've uh, kept me this night through Jesus Christ mm -hmm. from all harm and danger. I pray that you would this day also keep me from sin and every evil, that all my doings mm -hmm. and life may be pleasing in your sight. Mm -hmm. That's that prayer. All that my doings and pleasing in your sight is that prayer that the Lord guide me and keep me. For into your hands I commit myself, my body and soul, are all things that the holy angel have no power over me. No, 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 Pardon me? Devil may have no power over me. The devil. <laughs> Thank you for correcting me. I have to almost pray at Possess sequence. <laughs> so then, speak what you know in a variety of ways. Um, sometimes we just follow in a cliche rut. And it's been so good 
being able to preach almost every week. Because if I'm going to speak the gospel, I've got to speak it in a different way. Or maybe at times, not just refer to baptism and the Lord's Supper, but speak the power of the baptism and the Lord's Supper in a way that becomes fresh. Same in our just conversations with one another. Okay, I think that's it for today. Looking at the clock, let us close with the benediction. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> I think we're